Coming live from Washington, USA is our guest tonight. Welcome to this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts, either through the industry insights, information, or simply learning from them. And today we have Stephen Lynch, a business coach, entrepreneur, podcast host, firefighter, and he will be talking about why you can't beat the algorithm and why you should do and why what you should do instead welcome to the show steven oh thank you so much for having me it's definitely a pleasure to be here today thank you thank you steven thank you for joining us thank you for your time so you know we'll be talking about this big thing because everybody is trying to beat the algorithm wherever they are and nobody yeah. i guess uh, is succeeding that they want to the way they want to and they are take, doing it themselves they are taking help from others but as you said uh, you can't beat the algorithm and what you should do instead. So what do you mean by you can't beat the algorithm? And can you explain it to us? And who do you mean? Who's the algorithm? Yeah, absolutely. The algorithm would be Google or Bing or Yahoo, any of the big major search engines. And beating the algorithm is essentially the on-site SEO that we've come to know and really dislike doing. Right. So. If I go to your website, you're going to say you're great. And I go to my website, I'm going to say I'm great. So how does Google know who to rank higher than who when someone's looking for our services? Right? That's the algorithm. Is you know, It's not just an individual person who's going to each website and saying, oh, this person does work better. It's Google's robots going through every site and saying this person's more relevant than this person. Right? And so beating the algorithm is that Google has changed from who they were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, whenever Google came about from the very beginning of, you know, the internet time. And so that's, that's what I'm, I'm happy to expand on that and kind of the shift that Google's taken and kind of the trust bias that goes in there as well. Yes, please. Yes. I guess more than 80% of the uh, whole internet search uh, business, it's, it all belongs to Google. So that would be very helpful for us to understand. So please tell us in detail exactly what uh, you want to tell us on this particular part about Google's algorithm and how we can beat it or not beat it and instead what we should do about it. Yeah, absolutely. So people used to be able to figure out how Google worked, right? And they figured out like, hey, we can stuff a bunch of backlinks and we can do, you know, these different SEO tactics and we can rank really high very easily. And Google found out that people were doing this and then I think it was like 2007, 2008, somewhere in there. And they, you know, blacklisted and banned thousands of websites and totally revamped how their algorithm worked. And even the people who have created the Google algorithm don't understand it. Like they understand a small portion of it, but it's so large and so massive that even the people who made it don't fully get it. And what we've seen these last few years is that Google's made a shift from on-site SEO to brand recognition and social proof. So this is how you beat the algorithm because you can't beat the algorithm anymore with traditional SEO. It still is helpful. I mean, there's still things that your website should have to help it rank better. Like it should be optimized for all devices. You should have a sitemap. You should have Google Business Profile or Google My Business. Right? These things that are available and that makes a good user experience. You should have very specific web pages and you know the headlines and stuff. Like those things are important and good. But as far as being like, hey, I can do all these. SEO tricky things and trick essentially the algorithm into making me rank higher doesn't work that way anymore. It works to an extent, but not to where you can compete against people who actually use social proof and brand recognition. And so you've seen, or I'm assuming that you've seen if you use Google, that there's the things now, uh, the star reviews, right? So you can have star reviews next to your business and I'll show you, know, three, four, five stars and how many people have left you reviews and stuff like that's one of the metrics of social proof. One of the other main metrics of social proof though is your visibility from other places. So one thing that I do for my clients, I do digital marketing, I'm a digital marketer, and we create content, we create news articles, blog posts, YouTube videos, UBC, Vimeo, right? these video services. We do podcast audio for different directories. We do slideshows and infographics. And then what we do with that content is we distribute that to hundreds of different media sites. And a lot of them very high quality, trusted sites from Google, right? Like Yahoo Finance is one of our ones that we publish to, and they have a trust factor of 92. And so this goes into the domain authority and domain ranking. So if you 
are very savvy with um, how websites work. You should know this. If you don't, that's OK. You'll get a little bit of uh, education here. But Google has a trust rating for every website, and it goes from 0 to 100. So 0 is if you made a brand new site, Google doesn't know you, Google doesn't trust you. You can say whatever you want, and Google doesn't care. Whereas Yahoo has a trust factor of 92. So whatever they say, Google says they're telling the truth. Like this, whatever they say is pretty much as it is, right? So by publishing on these big names media sites that say, hey, check out Steven. He does, we'll call it dog grooming in you know, Alabama or Washington or wherever it is that you want to say, you know, or a doctor or engineering, whatever it is that you provide, when you leverage all these big name media sites to do these things, Google ranks you higher because they say, oh, this is social proof. This is brand recognition, right? And then within that, even there's more tech technical stuff, like how you do the writing, how you do the headlines, how you do the content and the way that it's structured. And because there is certain things that are important with it, right? It gets, it gets technical in that way. But at the very basic level, that is how you get around the algorithm. Because instead of patting yourself on the back, right? Saying, hey, I'm really great. Check me out, Google. You have other people, these trusted third-party sites, saying, "Hey, check out Steven or check out, you know, Bob. He does this service really well." So, hopefully, that was not too long of an explanation. But that's not not that's at all. It, it, it was not at all long, and in fact, uh, uh, don't call it long at all because we are going to talk a bit much more on on this whole stuff because the whole world is on the internet, mm -hmm. and everybody wants. Uh, two, three things or whatever they want individually. But from business perspective, uh, they are either uh, want to be present there so that uh, their customers, their other stakeholders, they can reach them. For creators, there's a whole creator economy. So they are also there on uh, Google and other platforms. So we'll take them one by one and we'll get your in insights in understanding on how exactly, as you can say, all these places have algorithms. And then, as you said, what you should do instead. So when we talk of Google, and you call it Googler, why do you call it Googler, by the way? <laughs> I just, I think the calling it the Googler is really silly and funny. You know, I, okay. I, I, I tell bad jokes. I'm a dad, and I, I tell them <laughs> because they make me laugh, not because they're necessarily funny jokes. So it's, it's just one of, the, one of the little things I call it. So this one is a good bad joke. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> absolutely. A good bad joke. <laughs> good bad joke. Okay. Yeah. So when you talk of uh, Google, then you talk of mainly two things. One is from the website perspective. Mm -hmm. And then you talk on the YouTube part of it. Yeah. And recently, if I understand, Google has been working on its algorithm. It's got given some new updates, September 12, around something, if I'm write some i read it on one of the websites and a lot of things are changing so people are trying to understand what exactly it means some people were guessing that perhaps it is to you know understand better or to stop uh, ai generated content and perhaps it will stop it and people who are generating content online uh, uh, through artificial intelligence sources or in, uh, uh, apps and whatever so they will not be able to uh, figure at the top in, in, in Google searches and all. How do you uh, see this particular stuff? Well, how exactly, in fact, let me ask you, mm -hmm. how should people make themselves uh, visible the way they want to and uh, simply sales or as creator, you want your content to reach as many people as possible and without tinkering with the algorithm or without getting too much about uh, learning too much about algorithm because it keeps on changing. So yeah. what should do people do on Google or Googler as well as YouTube? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, part of content and content marketing is that you're not worried about the algorithm, right? When you do onsite SEO, like you live and die by the algorithm. But when you do content marketing, it's very different because Google is like Amazon, right? Amazon doesn't make the jeans. They don't make the shoes. They curate it. And Google is the same in that it's not making the content, it's curating it. So when you say, I'm looking for you know, a plastic surgeon in you know, Bosnia, wherever it is, Google says, oh, who do I know that does this the best? And it looks through the content to say who answers the question the most appropriately and then gives that to you. 
Right? So when you make content, being specific is the best thing you can do. And so for people wondering, how can I be more visible? The real question is, how can you be more specific? Okay. Does that make sense? Right. Right. So right. If, I, if I make a website and say I'm a plumber, and my website says, hey, I do lots of plumbing things. I fix every single drain, pipe, sewer line. Call me. Right? Google's going to say, that's nice. Like, I don't really care all that much. That's really vague. But if I say, hey, I do you know, special toilet repair. I do special okay. types of dishwashers. And I fix plumbing for the groundhog garbage disposal line. When someone says, hey, I have a problem with this dis garbage disposal, Google goes, I know exactly who to recommend. Okay. Right? It's very specific. So when you create content saying, hey, I do X, Y, and Z, and you go even further in X location, right? As, as specific as you can make it will make you the winner. Because what Google wants to do is they want to provide the best user experience. So let's okay. let's rewind until like the beginning of time when Google came out, right? And I say that tongue in cheek as a silly joke because right, we're older than Google. Um, but when you'd say, hey, Google, how many bugs are in Africa? Google would give you five websites and say, hey, here's, you know, these will answer your questions to find bugs in Africa. And we've all seen a shift in that when you go to Google now and say, hey, Google, how old is you know, Prince Henry? Or when did the queen die? Google will tell you. It doesn't give you the links. It says Prince Henry is you know, 28 years old or however old he is. And then it'll say, do you want to know where Princess Diana lived? Like Google tries to keep you on Google. They're not trying to send you somewhere anymore. Like They want your data. But if they can't answer your question, then it lists in order who they think can answer your question the best. So as a service provider or a business person or an entrepreneur, or whatever you do, if you can be specific about what you do, Google's going to say when someone types a question, I'm having this problem, I'm looking for this type of product or this type of service, or I want whatever it is that you sell. When you're specific, Google knows how to recommend you, and they'll rank you higher because of that. So that's, that's the big question. And that goes across you know, news article, news articles, your own blog that goes to video and YouTube. And that I think is the hardest thing to do is to be so specific because as a business person, we feel like we're excluding a large number of our audience when we do that. And I say, Oh, you know, I want to serve all these, all these different people. But if I'm specific, like I'm only serving a small portion, but as you're consistently, uh, as you're consistently specific, you will continue to get more and more of those people. So you mean uh, it's like snippets, uh, snippets on Google. It answers a particular query, and mm -hmm. it may not be the topmost page on uh, on on Google. Uh, how does that does you, uh, do you, do you mean that? Kind of. What I mean is that the way that you make your content and the way that you make your website is very specific to the content that you're making, the problems that you're solving. So there is a very large plumber or window washer, I think it was a window washer and they service a very large area. But when you type in like window washing services in like Linden or window washing services in Kirkland or all these different cities, they actually have a web page just for that one city saying, Hey, we do window washing services in this location. And that's how they get around that. Like not being a generalist site, but being very specific of that. We will service your needs in this specific location. Okay. Okay, Stephen. So if it's a small business, an online business, mm -hmm. and they are into several things, uh, say in clothing, and they are into several type of clothing. Mm -hmm. Now, how do they become, uh, they, how do they not reduce their content or their variety of options? as well as become specific at the same time to feature in, you know, the Google con uh, Google considers them as mm, specific enough to be answering some query. How do you uh, manage those two things? Yeah. So within, within each product, like if you're having an e-com store, like make a really good description about that product. Be really specific. Is it for men or for women or for children? Okay. What size is it? The colors, like make sure that you are as specific as you can be. Is it comfortable? What's the brand that that shirt comes in? Does it have a tag? Is it tagless? Right, like all these little things that you can talk about and make it different from the competition. Right, you're not just selling a shirt; you're selling a 
size large for men's that's gray cotton you know sustainably sourced eco-friendly xyz like get really specific with what you are providing and it goes it doesn't matter what you sell whether it's a service whether you're a doctor or an engineer or plumber or an e-com like the more specific you can be the better off you're going to be with that because again google wants to give their users the best experience for what they're looking for and this goes into search intent like 70 percent of google searches are very specific long tail keywords and i'll give an example for a dentist i was driving and i was biting my nail and i chipped my tooth it was stupid but I pulled up my phone and I said, emergency chips tooth repair available now, Kirkland, Washington. Now, I didn't type in best dentist Kirkland, right? But that's if you use one of these online tools from like Google or Bing or whatever it is, right, for keywords, they'll tell you you should rank for best dentist because it's the highest competition. But that's not how people search, right? I'm not a active buyer if I'm searching best dentist. I am an active buyer or client if I'm searching for the problem, my solution. So being specific with, you know, your services in that way is also what you need to do. Okay. Okay. So, uh, how do you create your content? You just go and become specific. Is there, are there other things that one should look at while building their website? Mm -hmm. Not everybody takes help of outside consultants or outside, you know, digital marketers. A lot of people do it themselves because there is so much of dynamic uh, content or dynamic website they have that they need to update it so they do it themselves uh, so how do they do it uh, what should they remember what should they keep in mind when they want to when they are doing uh, in terms of content for their website yeah they need to approach content the way that their clients approach their services right so Okay. What we do is when I work with a client, I, I take a spreadsheet out, I sit down with them because people are like, hey, how do you know how to write about my business if you're not a dentist or a plumber or a, you know any of these things? And I'm not, but I can write about them because I sit down with the business owner or the marketing director and I say, tell me all the different services you provide. And you go through that and I say, well, let's talk about all the different benefits that you give. What are the frequently asked questions that customers are asking you? Right, those are search intent because people are going on Google and asking those questions, right? That's the answers they want. What are the problems that your product or service solves? Right? Where in locations are you trying to show up? Especially for a service-based industry, if you can show up, if you can say like, you know, Washington State or Seattle or break it down from big cities into like big neighborhoods, right? Because a lot of big cities, people know that area by the neighborhood. So in Seattle, there's Magnolia and Ballard and West Seattle. Like they're all Seattle neighborhoods. So you can say, you know, dog groomer in Ballard, right? Because that's how people are searching for it. They don't want to drive two hours to get to the other side of the city. <laughs> so being specific about that and approaching it the way that the clients are going to interact with how they're looking for you is the best way to do that. Right, Steven. Now, if it's, it's a business side, understood. Mm -hmm. What about podcasters or people who are creating content? Their site itself is a content site. Now, how yeah. do they define their content that it comes uh, at on priority on Google? How does that work for them? Yeah, very similar, actually. So when you're naming your podcast, right, make it name make its name uh, relatable to what you're talking about. Right? Like if it's a business okay. podcast, talk about business. Like make business something in the name of it. If it's you know if you're talking about dogs, talk, make sure that your podcast okay. isn't something like lampshades podcast but it's dog grooming usa podcast or whatever it is right like make it relatable to what you're talking about but then the episodes name them like how to show up on google or how to do x y and z because that's how people again are searching for stuff like they're looking for podcasts not just based off of like a name they're not no one's searching Stephen lens podcast right but they're probably searching how to show up better on google within the podcast platform and so making your, your titles that way works better too. And then something that's new is that you can actually get your podcast listed on imdb.com, International Movie Database. So okay. there's, there's a bunch of steps there, but that, that gives you that extra like SEO love, if you will, from Google and the search engines because IMDB is a, a massive site that is very credible as well. All right? so you can actually get on there and you know, list all your guests and the episodes and all that stuff as well. So the more links and information you can provide, right, Google's going to like you better 
because again, their whole goal is to serve you and serve that client and say, hey, this is relevant information for what you're looking for. Okay. Now let's go to YouTube. Mm -hmm. How does it work on YouTube? Uh, there also you have algorithm. Now you don't want to uh, dupe the algorithm. You want to be true to yourself and and you want your content to reach as many places as possible. So how yeah. does it work for you? It's, I mean, it goes back to this. I'm, I feel like I'm going to keep saying the same thing because it all goes hand in hand, right? Like, because what I do again okay. is I, I do the news articles and the blog posts and the, the video for YouTube and the audio and all that. But like, it's all very specific and talks about the exact same thing. Now I use different words the way that I talk about it. Like the news article is very newsy, right? It's very third person. The blog post is much more personal in the language that we use there. The video is we just use a slideshow video because we're after like the recognition from being on the platform, not necessarily from the viewers. Um, and we use, you know, relevant tags. That's important, right? Put the link in the description where you want people to go to. So within the YouTube platform, I think part of it goes to what's your intent? Is your intent to grow an audience or is your intent to have just the SEO like love from Google? Is your intent to make sales from what you're doing? That really dictates the way that you make that content and provide that content and what you do with it. Right? If you're making a following, then you need to be yourself and you need to be engaging and you need to be charismatic. Right? But the most important thing is you have to be authentic. Right? Be who you are because people see through that and they, right. you know, we're in this new age of we want something genuine. We want something real. If you're looking to make sales, right, like you need to work on how you present your product and service and make that sales copy. You need to be very educational, right, because there's a thing called the buyer's journey. People who go to YouTube looking for a solution want the information. That's like a recipe in a cookbook, right? I don't care about the story. I want to know how to make macaroni and cheese. Right. Right. And then the same thing, like if whatever your purpose is, that's the way you need to do it. And then if, again, if your whole goal is to just get the recognition from Google that you're on the platform, you know, make sure you're using all the right tags and just relevant content that's very educational again, right? And the third party-ish, very newsy. You don't have to have a million followers looking at it, right? Like I can get my YouTube videos ranked on the Google search because it's with all the other things that I do. And it's very specific, you know? Steven Lentz does X, Y, and Z in X location for these types of clients. If this is your problem that you have, you should check me out here on my website. I, like that's the type of video it is. Right. So. Right, Steven. Now you see, you have been a firefighter for several years, around 10 years. Mm -hmm. And now you are firefighting for your clients. You are helping them, you know, uh, scale, build and scale their businesses using the only metric that counts is profits. Yep. And a lot of businesses talking of profits are also on uh, Instagram and Facebook. So we are moving out of uh, the Google uh, mm -hmm. part of it and we move uh, to Instagram and Facebook. Now, they, there is a lot of churning going on. Instagram seems to be, uh, the, as they say, they are trying to copy somebody. Somebody is saying they are trying uh, to do this from this place and this from this place. Too. They are copying Be Real. A lot of different articles are coming in. I sometimes uh, do read them. Sure. Now, in a time like this, mm -hmm. what is it that a seller or small business who has built up his profile or trying to build up his profile or even a creator? Uh, because everybody wants to say, understand uh, algorithm. Some people say hashtags are important. They were using 30 hashtags as much as Instagram was allowed. And then they said, no, 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 hashtags do not matter. Some of the company people perhaps told that, yeah, hashtags are important, but perhaps not that important. I don't know what's the full exact version. But uh, so how do you now see this particular platform and still make sure that you are not trying to do anything with the Google uh, algorithm, but you are still being found out by their system whatever sure. they are going to make the change now makes total sense i don't do a whole lot of social media stuff i don't really i don't do any instagram or facebook like that's not in my wheelhouse for my specialties um and part of it is because i don't like the clients that come from there right the people that for if you're selling jewelry 
right? Instagram, Facebook, these social media sites are really great. If you're a lawyer trying to sell your services there, don't, don't make sense. Right? Like people go to these platforms to escape. And so you have to, you have to look and be like, is this where my audience lives? Because a lot of people think, oh, I have a business. I should be on social media, right? Like that's how I'm relevant. I need, I need to be visible on the TikTok and all this other stuff, but it might not actually be true for you, right? Like if I sell hats, yeah, social media is great, right? People are looking for education or not education, but entertainment. And they see a funny hat and they're like, oh, that looks neat. Like I'm curious now, but no one gets, you know, bit by their dog and wants to sue their neighbor and hops on Facebook and says, boy, I hope I see an ad for a good lawyer today. Right. It's not, that's not where they live. So I think looking at your business and saying, is this where my audience lives? I think is the most important question. And then making content based off of that, whether that's going to YouTube or making articles and blogs and that kind of stuff, like being visible everywhere you can is really great. And there's nothing wrong with more visibility, but I think a lot of business owners get distracted by social media and that they think that that's where they should be. And it's very difficult to make social media work because you're trying to take people who are there for entertainment into loyal brand customers for yourself. And that's just a hard transition. Right. Right, Stephen. Then uh, how do you make sale? You just depend on uh, Google, especially for coaches and all those stuff or consultants. How do you do? You just uh, remain confined to uh, Google, YouTube, or are there other options that are coming for them? Because at the end of the day, you've got to make sales. Where do you get your sales, especially if you are totally dependent on online uh, you, you, you exist only online. How does it work for you? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's always options, right? And with today and by today, I mean the age of the internet, like it's very easy to meet people and join networking groups and to have your brand visible in front of lots of people. Like there, you have options. You don't have to say, like, I can only survive doing blogs or I have to survive on Instagram. Like you can join business networking international and, you know, have a meeting every you know, Tuesday or Thursday or whatever it is with a group of 20 or 30 people and say, Hey, look at what I do. This is what I sell. Right? There's places that you can go to show what you do. So it's, it's tough, right? Like every business is unique and where they should show up is I think dependent on what they do and who their audience is. But you know, this is why when we create content for our clients, we hit six different places. Right. We do news articles, we do blog posts, we do video, we do audio, we do slideshows, we do infographics because omni-channel marketing, right? One, it's good to catch the people everywhere they are, but two, Google also says, hey, you show up in a lot of different places, you must be valuable. So it's kind of how we cut through that noise and we say, hey, this is where I am. If you're an online store, paid ads are great. Right? When it comes to actually like the cost of, um, return on investment or cost of acquisition for a client. If you're pure e -com, paid ads generally do as well, if not better than organic traffic marketing. Now, if you do a service like a lawyer or a doctor or something like that, your organic cost of acquisition is much lower than it is for paid ads. So just again, like you have to understand your business to make the right decision. Okay. Okay. So, you just have to be, you know, you talk about being credible uh, online. So what does yeah. it mean? You just have to be, you know, they should think that you are a great dentist in whatever you have advertised or what does it mean? Is there more to it? Being credible online is showing up organically. Like if we look at a chart of how people use Google or the search, right? Being Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, it doesn't matter. Name your search engine. Okay. But five to 7% of the traffic goes to the paid advertisements, right? We're not very credible for using paid ads and that's all we show up for because people know that you're sitting on that page just because you handed Google some money, right? That's why people skip that. And the very first organic listing gets roughly 40% of the traffic. The second listing gets about 20%. The third listing gets about 10%, right? That's a huge amount of the people who go to Google and they say, hey, I want you to answer my question for me. And that's how they click. And so being credible is that Google thinks that you provide a good service and they list you up on top in the organic rankings. And the other way that you're credible, right, is that social proof. You have reviews on your website, right? You have those star reviews when people are searching for you in Google 
or you have other articles about you, right? Again, like what I do is being published on Bloomberg or Yahoo. So if you have an article from a third party news site that says, hey, check out Steven, he does really good work in this area, that makes you more credible than your competition. Right? If I have multiple first page rankings and they're not my own website patting me on the back, you're much more credible than your competition at that point. And so if I'm looking for, especially for a high ticket service, like a lawyer or something like that, and I'm trying to do my research of who's the better lawyer, and I say, oh, I have you know, Bob's lawyer agency and it's his own website, and I have Rick's lawyer agency and it's his website and three other news articles about him, Rick is much more credible. Right? The same thing with the reviews. If someone has a lot of reviews, they're much more credible than someone who doesn't have any. So again, this is why Google's also moving to that social proof brand marketing is that when you have more people talk about you, that's not just you patting yourself on the back, you're much, much more credible. And the danger there is that a lot of people are buying reviews, right? And that is a huge, huge no-no because Google is actively looking for everyone who's buying reviews and shutting them down. So you may have someone like, hey, I bought you know 200 views and I'm showing up. That's great and you'll show up for a while, but Google is very smart and they will eventually find you. Right? We had someone who they, they didn't buy any reviews, but they went to a network meeting and was like, hey, I want everyone to leave me a review. And so like 10 people made, did a review right away for them and Google was like, ah, this is not right. Like this is not how people interact with a brand. Like you don't go from zero reviews to just 10 reviews. Like, this is fake and they shut them down. So they're actively looking for suspicious review behavior. And so if you get reviews, it's great, but be careful about it because buying reviews will get you. They're, they're after it. Okay. Okay, Steven. Uh, now in terms of, you know, uh, we're just talking about uh, AI generated content as a mm -hmm. digital market and who deals with Google and YouTube. Uh, how do you see this? Apparently Google has said that they will not take to artificially generated content, AI generated content too kindly. How do you see this and what's your advice to your clients or what to, to other people, uh, in, independent consultants or individuals who are looking at, you know, doing, doing all these things? Yeah. I understand the attraction to it, right? It's economical. It makes it easy. It's quick, right? If you can have a computer write some content for you. But again, we have to look at what is Google's main priority. And Google's main priority is to give the best user experience to the people who use Google. And again, people want something that's genuine. We want something that's real i.e. we want something that's human. Okay. Right? And so Google is saying, this is made by a robot. This isn't a genuine human thing. I don't want that for my user base. Right? Okay. So I understand the attraction for it. And if you, you know, again, it goes back to your intent. If your intent is just to have a blog that, you know, is to engage your reader base, but not necessarily do anything else, that's totally fine. You can absolutely use an AI to write content for you for that. But if you're trying to do content that is ranking on Google and getting you organic traffic and stuff, then you need to have someone that's a person be writing actual specific content for you because Google cares about that. Right? There's We use some automation in how we create our video and our slideshow and stuff, but all of our content that we create is done by a person. Right? And when we submit this, the articles and stuff for that, like I go through it personally and I proofread it and make sure that it looks right and sounds right and it's a person's touch. So you can't you can't skip it. Like it's it's attractive. It makes a lot of sense when you look at terms of efficiency, but in terms of what Google wants for the user experience and how they're going to treat your content and treat you, you, you need a person. Right. Right, Stephen. So uh, we have talked a lot and we have given quite good insights and in how to you know, navigate this whole internet space, space, especially in terms of Google and YouTube and others. Obviously, they have their own uh, customers and uh, client base. Now, so let it be at that because you know we there is so much to talk about the internet. And in, in, it's very difficult to 
learn all this in 35 minutes that we have talked. Because for that, they will have to either come to you or to get hold of all the resources that you uh, help with. So how can people connect with you? How do they engage with you? How do they do that? Yeah, absolutely. So my website, and it's being redone, and you'll see some different variations coming out here, but it's Ocelot Traffic. So it's O-C-E-L-O-T. T R A F F I C Ocelot Traffic dot com. And from there you can book a call with me and you can also sign up straight for right right from there for my services. Right. Right, Stephen. On this note, it's a wrap on this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live. Thank you so much for joining in, Stephen. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.